One, two. Yes. Look at that, it works. Um, right, okay. So I have a number of things to fess up to during this talk. Um, the first of which is that I came up with the title before... Hello? No, I came up with the title before I had any idea about what I was going to talk about. But I'm going to stick with the title, and therefore I have structured my talk into two parts. The first part is entitled, I Gave Up Investment Banking, in which I will not talk about giving up investment banking. Um, so I wanted to go back a bit to explain how I came to be in investment banking. Um, uh, believe it or not, I did not dream of being an investment banker when I was a kid. Um, this is me as a kid. Cool, eh? Come on, mustard onesie. Um, with um, three quarters of my siblings and my mother. Um, my brother, Philip. Um, when I was a kid, um, I was very clear on what I was going to be. I was going to be a scientist. Um, and I knew that scientists looked like this. These two scientists are from important 1980s film, Weird Science, um, and they are doing science. Um, but something else important happened in the 1980s, other than seminal 1980s film, Weird Science, and that was computers were invented. Well, as far as I was concerned, computers were invented. Computers looked like this, as being demonstrated here by Matthew Broderick from seminal 1980s film, War Games. Um, I was fascinated with computers as a kid, um, and after a great deal of badgering, I managed to convince my parents to um, drop a not insignificant sum of money buying a second-hand BBC Micro. Cheer if you use a BBC Micro. Come on, come on, BBC Micro. Um, this was, of course, the most awesome computer in the world at the time. It had cutting-edge computer graphics, as you can see. Um, it also had sound. It had colour and it had sound, which, as we will discover later, are two of my favourite things. Um, so basically, when I should have been you know, doing normal teenager things like getting drunk and vomiting, um, I was instead spending every waking hour and many hours I should have been asleep writing code on a BBC Micro. Um, and then I moved from that, basically. I, I mean, it was clear that at that point that, that computing was what I was going to do. That all dreams of being a, you know, a, a crazy physicist had gone. I was now going to be a computing scientist. So I went to the amazing Glasgow University. Is anyone here from Glasgow? Yes, come on, Glasgow University. Glasgow University, the beautiful Glasgow University, um, where I then spent the next 10 years in this rather drab building, the computing science department at Glasgow University. Um, notice I said 10 years. I went there to do a degree, and I was still there 10 years later. So that was one of a number of mistakes I made in my life. Um, uh, I was persuaded to stay on and do a PhD, which I attempted at for six years um, before um, uh, something marvelous happened, which was that I, I met the love of my life, and after a couple of years, she said to me, I am moving to London. You can come too if you want. Um, and I thought about it a bit and then thought, I'm not going to finish this PhD. I don't know why I've been trying. Um, and I walked out on it, something I think I wouldn't have done if it hadn't been for her. Um, much of this talk will be about how I've done things that I wouldn't have done if it hadn't been for someone else. Um, so I moved instead to the beautiful surrounds of Kilburn in London, um, where we lived in a very damp basement for some time. Um, so this was 2000. Um, London 2000s, there was like one industry that was hiring computing scientists, you know, to a first approximation, and that was investment banking. Now, everyone knows what an investment banker looks like, right? They look like this. They point at things, they answer phones, they ruin lives. <clears throat> I was going to be an investment banker. Um, this is what I look like as an investment banker. That, this rather grainy picture is actually me at work in a real bank. You wouldn't believe it, but um, investment banking is, is a lot less than, um, like the films than you'd imagine. Um, you can get away with a lot more, first thing. People don't really wear braces. They don't really point to things. They do answer phones. Um, they do ruin lives. <clears throat> um, you'll notice here that I'm looking at a, a screen of lots, well, next to me is a screen with lots of graphs on it. That really does happen, though. 
In this case, I had no reason to be looking at graphs, of, um, graphs on screens. I just put it there because I thought it made me feel a bit more like I was doing important banking things. Um, you will find that almost everyone in investment banking is doing the same thing. They are looking at screens of graphs, um, trying to feel like they are doing important banking things. I designed a lot of software that looked like this. Um, uh, I'm going to let you into another secret. There is no reason for banking software to look like this. It is designed like this because it makes traders feel important. That is why you design it like this. Because if it's, not, if, it doesn't, if it's not black and with lots of green and red numbers that flash every now and then, they don't feel like they're doing real work. The truth is, actually, traders just use Excel. The whole banking industry just uses Excel. All the rest is for show. I can let you into that secret because I was there. Um, so, second part of my, my important talk begins now, which is titled, To Become a Digital Artist. Um, I, I never intended to be an artist. I had no concept of the idea of being an artist. Um, I liked art at school. I mean, I liked drawing and things. Um, the idea of being an artist hadn't occurred to me. I don't know how many people here have ever thought of being an artist, or already are artists. A few people, there you go, there you go, okay. So, um, I don't know, I mean, to me, this is what I assumed artists looked like. They look like brooding geniuses, splashing paint on things. Um, making, you know, making incomprehensible works of, of, you know, incomprehensible art. That's what I thought art looked like. Well, there was obviously no reason why I would be an artist. Um, but then one day I met someone who changed my expectations of what being an artist was because I discovered that artists also look like this. This is my dear friend Andy and colleague for many years um, who would probably not thank me for putting that picture up, which is why I chose it. Because I believe this is being videoed so he might see it. Um, hmm? I'll send him a link, yeah, once, once there is a link, I will definitely send him a link, don't worry. Um, so I met him, I think 20 years ago, um, at a party. He was hanging a door, as you do at a party. Um, he was there early to hang the door before the party began, and I got there early, because I always show up for things early. Um, and he was hanging a door. Um, I didn't speak to him then, but then later in the evening, I was introduced by the host, um, and I saw a drawing on her wall, and she said, oh yes, Andy teaches drawing, you should talk to him. So I went and talked to him, and I thought, I used to like drawing, maybe drawing's a thing I could do. Because um, Andy, he taught drawing, he taught life drawing classes. So he convinced me to come to his life drawing classes. So this is while I was still at investment banking, I hadn't given up yet, this is why the first part of the talk was inaccurately titled. I haven't given up yet. So I'm still an investment banker, and I started drawing. This is one of my drawings. Um, yeah, look at that. Look at, look, at, look at how I'm using space to make it feel like I'm a proper artist. Huh? That's me, that's me trying to, trying to you know, channel an art, an actual artist who knows what they're doing. Um, so at this point, I should probably talk about what actually happened in terms of giving up investment banking. I didn't really give up investment banking so much. Um, what happened was the 2008 financial crisis. You might have seen this picture before. Newspapers love to print pictures that look like this, of people going, oh. Um, the bottom fell out of everything, basically, in 2008. I don't know if everyone remembers that. Um, uh, so I was there on the inside when the bottom fell out of everything. Um, I was working for a, a credit hedge fund um, and of course, everyone remembers it was called a credit crisis, right, or the credit crunch. What happened was, my hedge fund lost about $2 billion, um, which is a significant amount of money, it turns out, even, you know, for investment banking. Um, that hedge fund now no longer exists because of that. Um, uh, in fact, I was moved to a different department. They thought, okay, Jonathan can go do this other thing. Um, the other thing turned out to be significantly more boring than working in a credit hedge fund. Um, so I said, how about you give me voluntary redundancy instead? And they said, no. I said, I have a lawyer who says yes. 
because the great thing about being an investment bank is you can afford lawyers. So this is the, this is the, the big secret in investment banking. So the reason there's no unions in investment banking is because investment bankers can afford lawyers. And if you have a lawyer, you don't care about a union. You just say that you, the lawyer writes a letter and they do what you say. So I said, I am going to leave and you are going to give me the money to leave. Um, and they agreed. So I took voluntary redundancy. Um, and this was back at the, sort of the beginning of the credit crisis when um, people were actually getting reasonable amounts of voluntary redundancy. So it wasn't a fortune. I'm not gonna, I didn't work there long enough to really, I got out too quick, I guess. Damn, it was a mistake, wasn't it? Um, so I didn't really make a huge amount of money, but I had a bit of a nest egg kind of thing. And I thought, I can probably survive for a little while. So maybe I just won't get a job again for a little while and see what I want to do. Um, at this point, I still had no intention of leaving investment banking. I just thought, you know, I'll go back later. Um, but um, around this time, um, I was starting to meet more artists, I suppose, um, through Andy. So I met also this person, Hillary, a um, uh, great friend of mine as well. Um, and the three of us were sitting in this bar one day. Has anyone ever been to the Foundry in Shoreditch? Yes. The now dearly departed Foundry in Shoreditch. The great art pub. Um, so we were sitting in there one day um, and Andy said he had this great idea for an artwork for the Foundry. So the Foundry was an old bank and it had this second level basement which was the old bank vault. Um, and he had this great idea. The bank vault had this most extraordinary acoustics like super long reverb, it was, you walked in there and you made a sound and it was just in enveloping, it was amazing. Um, and the thing about the Foundry was they put on strange, like super strange artworks all the time, like a really ear bleeding, eye bleeding, weird things going on. Um, so they were willing to put up with almost anything. So we talked to the, the bar and he said, yeah, go on, you do your idea. So the three of us, decided to form an art collective, which is Output Arts, which some of you may see me wandering around with this, um, which is still going, except now it's just Andy and I. But anyway, we decided to make Andy's idea, and he wanted to make a wind harp. Has anyone ever heard of a wind harp? Yeah, there you go. So um, also called uh, Aeolian harps. Um, so the idea with the wind harp is that if you put a, now it's called the de-something effect, I can't remember, I'm afraid, but if you put a string in wind, the string will start to vibrate. That's the principal idea of it. So you put a bunch of, so normally people make these big, beautiful wooden wind harps with, um, you know, beautiful shapes and long strings and you listen, to, you listen carefully to it and you can hear it sing. This is what our wind harp looked like. It looked like a couple of bits of two by two wood with some double bass strings strung across it. Um, and the key thing here is that what we decided to make was an electric wind harp. So that's the electric bit. So this is where I came in because I'd done a bit of electronics at university and so Andy was like, you can make that, can't you? And I'm like, probably, maybe. Um, so we made this installation. It was called Three to Four. Um, and it ran, this is in the bank vault, which is just this big white featureless room. Um, and it was the sound of that wind harp piped down and amplified inside the space. Um, and then what Andy called a color field projection, that I had no idea what this was, but he said basically if you, if you, if you project color onto a wall, it's a color field projection. I'm like, okie dokie. Um, so I wrote some software that would listen to the sound of the wind harp and then project a colour basically and it was it was really naughty stuff. I just like picked three frequencies and went, oh that's red, green and blue. It'll change colour based on how much volume each frequency is. Um, uh, and it we and changed it so it went really slowly. And the idea with the colour field projection, as it was explained to me, was that if people have got something to look at, but it's not too complicated, they kind of defocus and they listen harder. So this is one of the first art things I learned as an artist, um, which was that people listen when they're looking. Um, so we made this piece, and it was beautiful. I've got to say, you know, it was actually, it was a good idea Andy had. 
Um, but I learned some important things from it. I learned that art also looks like this. Um, and maybe this is not a big surprise to people, but it was a big surprise to me because I thought art was splashing paint, and it turned out art could also be wiring cables. Um, and art could also be this kind of thing, soldering things, and in this case, I'm winding a square eel. Um, so I started to basically, at this point, I did not call myself an artist at this point, I want to be clear. At this point, uh, I thought Andy and Hillary were the artists, and I was just like their tech support person. That's kind of what I said. I used to introduce myself to people like that. I'd like, yeah, Andy, here's the artist. I just kind of like make things. Um, in, these square eels went into this piece, Lost and Sound, which is another one of the great pieces we made that I love, um, which was um, we saw someone with a metal detector on the beach one day and we thought, that's beautiful. Something about the, the way people walk around with metal detectors listening really slowly. And we thought, there's something in that, isn't there? So we made this piece that looks like metal detectors, but they're story detectors. So we put, um, effectively we put, um, sorry, words going on my head, oyster cards. You know, the same thing as you used to use in the tube, um, in the sand. And the square eels detected the, the ID of the cards. And when they hit a particular card, it would play a story in your earphones. Really simple idea. Um, in, like, turned out to be an incredible piece. All the stories were about loss. And it was a really profound piece. Um, I would like to take credit for that, but the whole profound idea is that came from other people. Um, but I made all the bits. So at this point, I'm still just making bits, not being an artist, really. Um, fast forward, like, 10 years of output arts. Oh, hang on, did I talk about... No, I did talk about giving up. Sorry, I've forgotten where I am. Fast forward 10 years, um, and I'm starting to make things that involve thousands and thousands of LEDs and custom boards and stuff that was like way more professional than I was making when I first started winding square reels. Um, but I, it's only really coming up to this point when I started to call myself an artist. Um, and it was an incredibly hard thing to do. Hands up if you are actually an artist, like you call yourself an artist. Did you find it a hard thing to do? Yeah, I found it... So this is the, the one sort of revelation, I guess, is that it is very tough, particularly, I think, if you... You know, the whole imposter syndrome thing, if you come out from another industry, it is even harder to say, I am an artist. Um, so for a very long time, I was not an artist. I was just a, a tech support person. Um, and then eventually, I kind of realised that, that, no, I was also making art. Um, and now I'm, I do things with teams of artists, which is great. We started to scale up to the point where you can actually have other people make things for you, which is also good because it's now got to the point where I just haven't got time to do all the soldering anymore. Um, so my dear friend Jabs here is my go-to solder person. Um, and we started making things that look like this. Um, so this is a piece we made for this Christmas just gone. Um, it's called Mother, um, Mothers of the Forest, that's right. Um, and these are four meter high illuminated sort of trees. They're meant to be baobab trees. Um, the Madagascan baobab tree. Anyone heard of that? Yeah, so that was the inspiration for this. Mothers of the Forest is another name for that tree. Um, this was just for a Christmas light show though. I'd like to, this is a very arty piece for a very Christmas show. It was kind of a mistake. It's also insanely complicated and prone to breaking. But um, we also make much simpler things, thankfully, like, has anyone seen these yet? Yay! So that's another output arts piece. Um, so this, in fact, was made out of leftovers. This was, um, this was an experiment in how simple could you make something. If you've wandered up and had a look at it, you'll see that it's very simple, which was a real delight to make something simple. How long have I got? 10 minutes, perfect, this is going well. Um, so another thing happened in terms of the whole collaboration thing while I was going along here, which is that as part of working with Output Arts, I met 
this woman, Beshi. Has anyone heard of Beshi? Some of you have, I know, because Cat Vives here. Um, so Beshi is, um, uh, I mean, just an amazing person, but also sort of multi-instrumentalist, producer, singer-songwriter, all-round good egg. And I met her a few years ago and started collaborating with her. And I started to do visuals for her. So the thing you see behind her, this is her performing at the Purcell Room last year. And the, the bit behind, that was me, which is very exciting. Look, here's a moving version of it. Um, so I'm gonna let that hypnotize you for a bit while I go on a sort of slight diversion, which is that in my original talk description, I said I was gonna mention neurodiversity. So I thought I probably should, because I said I was going to. So, I discovered a couple of amazing things, other than all the art stuff in the last few years. Um, one thing I discovered is that I'm autistic. Um, and I'd spent 45 years thinking everyone else was being difficult. <laughs> and then I realized it was me. Um, so I discovered that, and that was something of a revelation. I don't know if anyone's had a sort of a late diagnosis. Um, and it's like, you're like, oh my God, like all this stuff makes sense. Like all the stuff I've talked about for the last 20 minutes suddenly started to make sense. Like, this is why all this stuff was so hard. This is why I was failing at things. This is why I spent 10 years attempting to do a PhD. I'm just not cut out for that sort of stuff. I'm really not. Um, and the other thing I discovered recently, and this was even more profound, and this was like extraordinary, it blew my mind, is that I suffer from a thing called, wait, I'm gonna get the title right, the other thing I suffer from is not being able to remember the names of things. Um, it's called uh, hypophantasia. Anyone heard of that? I'm not quite aphantasic. So hypophantasia is like, I can't imagine things visually in my head. So this was more extraordinary than you can imagine because I didn't realize it until I was, I, it came up on Twitter. This little test, like, are you, are you an aphantasic? And I sort of looked at it and went, no. Nah. So I did the little test and I was like, oh, so the test, do you want another test? This is a great one, it's really interesting. So, imagine a ball on a table. Someone walks up to the table and pushes the ball. What happens to the ball? Okay, so, who imagined the person that did it? What they looked like? So when I did this thing, I didn't imagine anything, like the, the table, the ball, what it looked like, the person, um, any of it at all. I just understood the abstract concept of a ball rolling off a table. And I did the same test on Andy, my colleague, and he was like, oh yeah, yeah, the guy was wearing jeans, he had short hair, he had his back to me, the ball was red, the table was wood, it was an elliptical shaped table. I'm like, I just looked at him like, you are making that up. And then I went to speak to some other people and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, she was a woman, she had blonde hair, she did this, she did that. And I, and it, at that point, oh, I've run out of video. At that point, I suddenly realized that I don't imagine things at all. And I was talking to some, my, my flatmates and they were saying, what, when you read a book, don't you know what the people look like? And I'm like, no, do you? I'm like, yeah. Um, this has been an extraordinary revelation because I make visual art. How do you make visual art if you can't understand what things look like? This is like super confusing. Um, so, five minutes, haven't I? I'll make this work, don't worry. Um, I've realized that I make art the same way I write code, which is that I bash in a bit of code and I run it and see if it works and then I bash in a bit more and I run it and I iterate. And I make art the same way. I start making a thing and I look at it and I go, mm, no. And I change it and I look at it again. Mm, maybe. Um, and that's, I sort of iterate art the same way I iterate code. I guess I do everything the same way I do code, to be honest. I'm a coder at heart, really. Um, so that was my diversion to neurodiversity. Get yourself checked out in case you've got one too. Surely everyone here has got a neurodiversity. Um, back to Bishy. Um, I've also recently started making music videos for Bishy, which is, um, I made my second music video recently, um, which was something I never thought I would ever say. 
it's like you can't understand how extraordinary it is to me to say I made my second music video because I used to be an investment banker. How do you get from there to there? Um, and in a sense, lots of people come up to me, sorry, my watch is buzzing at me, really distractingly. It's telling me that my studio is about to shut. Um, I, lots of people say to me, how is it you've done, all, like, you do a lot of different things. Like, it's crazy, you do so many different things. I'm like, well, and the truth is, no, I don't. I do one thing. I write code. But it turns out that one thing has a multitude of applications. Um, hands up if you write code. Oh, look at all of you. Um, uh, learning to write code, clearly, you know, it, it was that BBC Micro, that, you know, completely has defined my life. Because I look at everything as code now. Usually Python. Um, for the last 25 years I've written, like Dan, where are you, Dan? I write Python. Um, this is not Python. If you're looking at it, you've already spotted that, haven't you? Come up to me later if you want to know what that is. Um, so all I really do is write code. I just write code in ways that makes a heart. Um, and I guess that's been a big surprise to me, is that this thing I learned can be art. Um, lots of things can be art, but also code can be art. Um, the other thing I learned is that um, I, for a long time, have struggled with understanding what it is I do as an artist. If you are an artist, you've probably also had this struggle of, yeah, um, you know, what is my practice? What is it I make as an artist? How do I dare I call myself an artist? It's part of this imposter syndrome thing. Um, but I've come to a realization recently, which is that um, standing in the background, pushing buttons and making things happen for other people, that is my practice. And I'm happy to do that. Um, collaboration is my practice. I'm not, because for a long time I thought, well, what is it I do? Because I'm always making things with other people. And I've decided that doesn't matter. Collaborating, that is an artistic practice. I'm able to realize things. I'm able to, to imagine things with other people. And that's, that's a powerful thing. And I'm proud of doing that, which is new to me to be able to say that, in fact. Um, so I guess, I'm, yes, this is really working. Look, two minutes left. Um, I'm coming to some kind of conclusion here, I think, um, which is you can give up investment banking to become a digital artist. <laughs> Hands up if you're an investment banker. Yes, look at that. You, sir, give up investment banking and become an artist. <laughs>